I was asked to, to talk about current trends in higher education, and that's like, where do you start? I mean, it's massive, yeah. Um, and then talking with Klaus, he said, let's focus on the governance reforms as a, as a starting point. So, um, hello. So that's what I, I thought I'd do. And I, being a, an old school, grammar school, Latin trained person, the world is divided into threes always. So I've just picked out three trends. One, you can't see this from now, can you? Um, trend one is the global knowledge economy. One of the um, contexts in which universities have been reformed recently in, or over the last 20 years really is in terms of the global knowledge economy. So I'm asking their question, how are universities positioned in the new complex organizations that make up the global knowledge economy? Trend two is the move to new public management. And there I'm asking the question, how are universities being created in a new kind of subject that's expected to negotiate new relationships and boundaries with diverse economic, political, and social interests in surrounding society. And the third trend that I've picked on is performance management. And I asked there, how do these transformations affect the values and daily work of academics, and how do they respond? So what I'm trying to do is, um, I don't know, to a policy if you like, but starting with the biggest picture and then working right down to what the everyday life of academics might be. Um, now, as background, I'm going to be picking from a whole range of different projects I've done in the past. So this is going to be very bad anthropology because I'm not going to be focused on one place and really going into that in detail. But since my most recent work has been about Denmark, that's going to keep coming up. So I think in the back of my mind, there's a lot of Denmark, but I've also been working across Europe and in and the Asia Pacific region recently, so um, I'll try and specify where I'm talking about in the time. So looking at trend one, the role of universities in the global knowledge economy. There's been a torrent of books from the OECD, from the World Bank, from all of those big international organizations saying that the future is a global, a, a global knowledge economy. And it's interesting, I've done a detailed analysis of some of these texts, and there's all sorts of linguistic tropes in those texts, because I can't remember what it's called in rhetoric, but they use the present tense to talk about the future, which means it makes it look as if the future is already here. And it's a very interesting way in which these international organizations have tried to make it look as if this future is inevitable, it's fast approaching, and you've got to get ready for it. And they've energized ministers. Uh, quite often the OECD ministerial meetings are videoed, and you can, you can get onto the street, and you can see the level of emotion that the ministers are all vying to be the good boys in the room, you know, to really have uh, all the right marks for, yes, we're preparing for this knowledge economy. Now, of course, that's in doubt. We don't know whether the knowledge economy is ever going to appear. Um, but universities have, have, been, have been repositioned. It's not just supporting the economy, which they have been from the 1980s, but now they're economic actors in their own right. And they're even, in Denmark, for example, treated as drivers of national competitiveness in the global knowledge economy. And this is because knowledge and students are seen as the raw materials of the global knowledge economy. And of course, we produce both. Um, so let's talk about universities should be more globally competitive, they should be international, they should be world class, they should get higher up in the global rankings. It's amazing how many countries want at least one of their universities in the top 100. Many more than 100 countries and many more than one, country, one university per country. Um, and it's almost like the company's economic results. This is how it's treated in Denmark. You know, if, if Copenhagen and all these can get into the top band of the Times Higher Ed, 
then they're, they're worth the money that the government's spending on them. It's kind of, it shows a return on, on investment. So how does one map, if one's going to look at universities in the knowledge economy, if that becomes the field of research in anthropological terms, how does one map the field of universities in the knowledge economy? Because universities are now located within a massive and complex array of industries and organisations. And they're responsible for negotiating those relations with all these actors. And one of the interesting things is that there's no longer a clear boundary around the university to say what the university is. So if you take, for example, in Britain, um, the, the border of Britain is not just in Calais, it's also in the registrar's office of the university because they're responsible for vetting applications to come to the university, not the home office has delegated that to the universities. So in a sense, the border regime of England is inside the university. On the other hand, when the university is trying to negotiate uh, a collaborative research with a, an industrialist, they may put the boundary around the university right at its very edge and be very strict about how they want money to cross ground and research freedom and protecting rights and all that kind of stuff. They might put the boundary of the university at its very edge. So the boundary is being renegotiated all the time and the location of that boundary differs uh, subject to subject. Um, now I'm going to skip the next bit because I can come back to this in questions but I'm going to run out of time otherwise. One of the things I've been asking of this is then, is this field, should we th think of it as an economy, as a global knowledge economy, or as an ecology? And let me just show you what, um, what I've been trying to, to do. Um, here, this is what we used to call the, the, um, the university sector. With the universities, the ministry, the university colleges are sometimes in there an association of rectors or vice chancellors, an academic union, a student union, all the kind of interests that, that honeypot around in universities. We, we used to call a sector. And now we've got all these different organizations around the university, and this is just a selection of them. You could keep going, making more and more bubbles around this map. But all the pathway providers for students and the um, external provision of, of um, courses, if you're at Cambridge University, for example, credit rating from the credit rating agencies is very important. They got a AAA from, um, from FITS and uh, Standard & Poor's, you know, the, the ones that kind of say that Greek, Greece has um, junk status. The, they, they work out the status of economies. They're now working out the status of university economies. And British universities are increasingly going to the stock market for the basic funding for doing expansion to attract these students. So Cambridge has just raised 300 million on the stock market because they've got a AAA rating from the credit agencies. Um, then we have a whole range of consultancies that are telling us how to run universities. Um, McKinsey's and um, all, all of those guys. And then there's a lot of pressure groups that are also like the Magna Carta and Versatatum, which is trying to say keep academic freedom going um, on the other side of the boundary. There's even more international agencies. I mentioned the World Bank, but you've got UNESCO, you've got the um, Bologna process, the OECD, all have units looking at the future of the university, scenario building, trying to say to universities what should be happening. On the other hand, there's a lot of community groups or civil society groups that also want universities to collaborate with them. There's a lot of companies that want universities to collaborate with them too on research. The publishing industry has gone through enormous changes in recent years, not only with open source, but coming up with a whole series of different um, business models about how to make a profit out of academic publishing. Then you've got the big four audit companies um, the, uh, PwC, Deloitte, KPMG, and Ernst & Young. I interviewed the PwC people a while back, and they explained to me that in Denmark, they, um, they advise the ministry on how to finance the universities. They advise the rectors on how to run the finances of the universities. 
they, um, they are the auditors of four of the eight universities. I, the, they had so many different roles, and I said to him, isn't that kind of like conflict? In oh yeah, we're used to managing those kinds of complex relationships. Mm -hmm. They're in there, they're into every little detail of what university, and they're all building up university divisions because they know this is a place they're going to make a lot of profits in the future. And then you've got the ranking organisations, the, the t Times Higher Ed, and then you've got also ones for business schools or uh, different parts of the world. There's a whole mass of them. So I just here just kind of tried to give you a picture of the range of organisations that are around the university now. So if you're thinking what the field of the university in the knowledge economy is, I've tried mapping it as a starting point like that. And then the big project I've had with the EU recently has been to position PhD students in each of these bubbles and really look at the negotiation of the relationships between the bubble and what used to be the university sector. And that's where we look at the boundaries and where they're forming and what, what shape they're taking. Um, as I said, I'm going to jump the um, formal economy. But out of this, um, the universities are generate, they're being given in a way by, by um, government reforms a new kind of subjectivity. And in Denmark, the reform in 2003 was labelled as setting universities free. Now, of course, when the academics heard that, they immediately thought that meant increased academic freedom, research freedom, more autonomy. Um, at last, the government's woken up to the fact that you know we do our best work when we have more autonomy. That didn't mean that at all. Um, what the minister meant by it was, um, Universities are responsible for exercising their own agency. So universities used to be state institutions. Now they were moved into a new status called self-owning institutions, which was never properly defined. Um, so they were no longer protected by the state against economic and political interests. They were a free agent, but on the other hand, they had to protect their own research freedom and their own research ethics. Nobody else was going to do it for them anymore. So if you think of it, if you go back to my previous diagram, whoops, where am I? The university is here, and all by setting the universities free, they, all of these interests around them have the right to make demands on the university. Everybody, everybody can, has the right. The, the week after the law was passed, the Minister of Education turned up in his official car at our rector's office in the Danish University of Education, knocked on the door and went in and told the rector what he wanted the research of the Danish University of Education to be. He gave us an agenda of what he wanted us to do. And there was uproar because everyone said, well, you know, the minister shouldn't be invading the, the hallowed halls of the university and telling him, no, he was absolutely acting in his rights now under the new law by setting the universities free, he could come and make demands on the university. But on the other hand, it was the university's responsibility to negotiate back and say, no, Mr. Minister, we can't do this because of that, and we don't want to do this because of that, but we will do this. And so to protect their research freedom and their ethics while negotiating with all the external demands. I don't know whether you've got a similar situation here, but certainly in Denmark, I don't think that the rectors or the um, governing boards have really understood the new subject position of the university. They've given in a lot to these demands rather than standing up and negotiating with them and they've not taken the opportunities to assert the autonomy that they should be protecting. So there's a new subject position for the university. Um, so the university is surrounded by this myriad of interests, all entitled to make demands on the universities. And by law, it says in, in the 2003 law that the university is responsible both for knowledge exchange, we have a new responsibility for knowledge exchange with surrounding society, so we're obliged to respond to these demands, but we're also by law have to protect our own research freedom and ethics. And one of the views of what was happening here 
was the idea that the university was then being set free to be a new power force in society, this was the phrase that was used. The idea that the university would have its energies released and it would, um, that the academics would come up with ideas about future research, future ideas of how society ought to be organized that were way beyond what the ministry could imagine or, or envisage. So this was the way in which the university was going to be a new power force in society. But the questions that weren't asked, and that as an anthropologist I ask, is well, who is the university? In the law it just said the university is the university that, it never said who the university was. So one of the problems about the board not fulfilling its role was it didn't know it was the university, which has now been clarified. Um, so who decides how to respond to demands from stakeholders and position the university in the knowledge economy? Is it the governing board? Is it the rector? Is it the academics? Is it students? Is it individually? Is it collectively? Those are all issues that have not been resolved. And the second um, question is then, does the university have internal process processes for protecting academic freedom and research efforts? And I don't think it does. It has disciplinary procedures for, for cheats, research cheats, but it hasn't got a procedure for discussing, um, well, we've got this big industrial company wanting to um, fuse with one of our research units. Um, what are the implications for research freedom, for, for IP ownership, for research ethics if they do that? Those kinds of decisions have been made in Danish universities without a, a discussion amongst academics or leaders, as far as I can see. So, that would be my first trend, that new subject position of the university in a global knowledge economy with new responsibilities. The second trend I would look at is the way in which new public management has disrupted the university sector. Now, quite often, the global knowledge economy and new public management are fused into always oh, neoliberalism, it's all the same thing and so on. But actually, it's quite interesting to separate those out as two separate trends. Because from my previous diagram, you'll recognize that was what the, um, what the sector used to look like with a ministry, universities, and their constituencies. And what's happened here, I think, hinges around the word autonomy. So with my focus on keywords, this has really become a keyword that I've chased all over the place and heard used in different places and by different people. And it's, it's very much came through in the Bologna process in Europe that the idea was that um, universities should be given more autonomy. And Yet when the Trends Report, the Bologna Process Trends Report number three, which it must be around the turn of the century, came through, it reported that rectors were really upset because the universities did have more autonomy, but at the same time, they had an increased burden of government steering. And so what's the meaning? Like I was looking at what does setting universities free mean? What does autonomy mean in this context? And one of the things you might have noticed that I had a funny gap in my previous diagram. Well, the reason I left that gap was because the ministry has moved out of the sector and is now one of the external demand-making units on the university world. So making universities autonomous has set them up in a separate relation to the ministry, a very new relation to the ministry. And you'll see that this arrow is twice as thick as any of the other arrows, and it's also much more intrusive. And let me explain why I want to argue that. Again, I'm going to use material from, from Denmark. The idea was that this was a reform that was going on throughout the public sector. It wasn't just universities. Universities were the last public institution to be brought into these reforms. And of course, the academics hadn't noticed the rest of the public sector being reformed like this. So it came as quite a surprise. And they oh, what's going on? Whereas if they'd looked at health and uh, welfare and everything else, they'd have seen exactly the same reforms going on and, and schools being brought into this process. The idea was that you, you um, make 
universities into self-owning institutions, and then you make them agents of government. So you set them up as a, a principal and an agent relationship using politics ideas of identification. And then you have a contractual relationship between the government and the university. So these are called development contracts, um, which set out what the strategic aims of the university are. And that is an, a contract that is signed by the head of the governing board of the university and the minister. So they actually physically, individuals, identified individuals sign this document. And those, uh, the, the board then um, appoints the rector and the rector then appoints the deans and the deans then appoint the heads of departments and all of the uh, academic forums have been abolished. So now you have a string of leadership from the top down um, which is all accountable upwards and it's gazed sort of directly upwards and there's no forums, effective forums going on amongst academics to talk with their leaders. In fact, uh, one of the newspaper journalists told about in an interview said, it's been amazing since the 2003 law reform, we've had so much more material on universities because all the academics bring us up because they've got nowhere to talk to their leadership apart from through the, thanks, apart from through the, uh, the newspapers. Um, and then, um, these leaders are then set performance indicators and payments by results. And then the, gov the, gov the ministry also has a scrutiny system. So this was called setting universities free. It was called making universities into self-owning institutions. But actually the way that the government constrained the liquidity of the universities meant that they had terrific steering over what was going on. They had uh, over the development contracts, over control of liquidity, and over the scrutiny process. They have very, very intense steering mechanisms uh, to control the universities. So you end up with a structure like this, which is a fairly classic kind of hierarchical bureaucratic system in the language of neoliberalism um, and devolved responsibility. And all the language is about devolving and autonomy and all this kind of thing, but actually you end up with a very tight hierarchy of leadership. And one of the key things here, and this is happening right now because the, there's a rumour going around, which the Ministry is not denying, that the Ministry now wants to take over appointment of the Chair of the Boards and approval of the members of the Boards. And bear in mind, the Boards already appoint them rector who appoints the deans who appoints the heads of departments. So this would be complete direct ministerial control running right the way through the university. And so I've been uh, putting forward an idea that actually to have an effective university system in this kind of new public management arrangement, one of the important things is to have clear what I'm calling hinge points. I'm thinking of like two bodies which have got different responsibilities. The university's responsibilities are quite different from what the ministry's responsibilities are. And yet they need to communicate, they need to negotiate, they need to hinge with each other. And what's happening in Denmark is that that hinge point was meant to be the governing board and it's disappearing and there won't be a hinge point in the system at all. If you look at American universities, quite a few of them have got an elected uh, council and an academic elected senate, and that's where the two ideas of the outside interests and the inside interests meet and negotiate. If you look at Sweden, the, the government appoints the governing board, but the faculties are, have responsibility, total responsibility for research and teaching, and they elect faculty boards. So that, that's the hinge point between the government appointed uh, governing board and the academic elected faculties. So, in most other systems, there's a clear hinge point, and I'm arguing that I think it's really important to make sure that a system has a clear hinge point, and a clear point where that new public management idea of the university being an entity responsible for itself, and the government having justifiable interests to negotiate with that entity, that can effectively happen. So that's my, my second trend. The third trend, 
The third trend is what I'm calling performance management. And this is where it gets down to the level of, of us. Um, because the performance management that the performance uh, indicators that are given to the university leaders filter down. And what's happening, at least in Denmark, is that um, there are performance indicators both for the idea of, uh, of universities and the global knowledge economy and for, for their role in, in the state and in the economic management. And these, these uh, performance indicators are things like Move along there to that six. There's a seat coming up there. It's okay, there's a seat coming up there. Yeah. So, for example, um, 43 boards were set up in Denmark with about 400 academics involved for over a year to work out what the top journals were in each discipline. And then that's been called level two, and you get so many points if you publish in a level two journal, and then all the rest are level one, and you get fewer points. And then the points of each individual person that counted up each year, and for each department, and for each faculty, and the, and the ministry allocates funding to the universities as one of the criteria on the number of points that you've, you've got for, for publishing. And there's another criteria which is um, we get paid for the number of students who pass exams. We don't get any money for bums on seats. We only get money for passing the exams. Um, and these are counted up. So in some universities, they actually count up how many um, people you've passed as an individual or as a department. Um, and then external funding for research um, is also counted, and PhD completions. Now, these, these kinds of indicators, I think, have some value. But when they get down to the individual, measuring individuals, it has a very negative effect. Okay. Um, so, one of the, I think this is my last slide, um, one of the um, effects of these is that academic stars, those rising stars, you know, all universities have two or three rising stars. Sometimes they're comet like and disappear. But, um, they get lots of external funding, and they set up um, research centres which are independent of the line management. They're like a car bump or on the end of that little triangle that I drew. And they're fine. They get on really well. But for the rest of us, um, a really successful department that I did research in, um, I, when I sat in on their meetings, all they talked about was their outputs counting the points they've got for their articles. They didn't talk about what had been in the articles, what they, what, what they were discussing, where their subject was going. I was just stunned. I mean, so that's one of the effects. What also happens more widely is that you know, academics, of course, focus on what counts. We're responsible people. We have to try and raise money for our department. We focus on what counts and not what matters. The top-down priorities and targets that our leaders set for us are always in terms of what we know already. They have to be. They can't see beyond the end of the year to what we might be doing. So they're necessarily conservative. So these kinds of target settings always hold us back. Added to that, the number of administrators that you need in order to administer this kind of system, especially when you've got a lot of external project funding, proliferate. So there's what's called that, uh, uh, administrative bloat. And in some studies I've done of, of the financing of universities, the administrators were telling me that they create the university's value, that the frontline activities of teaching and research are a cost on their activities. So it's a complete inversion of what the value of academic work is. And then, quite often, the strategic incentives don't align with the academic's professional motivation. And this was put over to me most strongly in one of the interviews I did. 
where a professor, a very respected professor, was almost in tears when he told me that he felt as if he'd put, been put outside of the door of his own house. So I've got a picture of a cat mm -hmm. sent out at night. And I think that kind of sums up some of the ways in which um, academics have responded to this kind of management. Thank you.